guys can thank Alec Gillis for our extra guest tonight. Let's please welcome up director Jean-Pierre Genet. Let's welcome up alien creature designer Alec Gillis. Actor Raymond Cruz. Visual effects supervisor Pito. Uh, we have the composer John Frizzell. And the miniatures creators and supervisors Ian Hunter and Matthew Gratzner. Very cool movie. From the director of a family. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Very sweet. <laughs> and how with amazing was that print? My god. With the distance. With, with the distance, it's it's very gore, gory. It's disgusting. <laughs> But let's, let's talk about this new vision. Um, I, obviously, it took some time before Fox decided to uh, bring another installment. And uh, maybe uh, Jean-Pierre, you and, and Alec can talk about um, getting involved and the idea, like sort of what were the early ideas for how the series could move forward? In fact, they wanted to hire Danny Boy at the beginning, and in turn off, and when they called me, I, I couldn't imagine. They were very courageous. They hired a French director that didn't speak English at all. I understood the story when I received the DVD with subtitles, much less. <laughs> and it was very courageous because, you know, I made just the city of our children, Delicatessen, but, you know, it was special. And in fact, I made an RT movie. That's what I read now, an RT movie. It's not an action movie, it's an RT movie. I replaced a lot of scenes. I, uh, action, for example, the nest, when uh, replay falls on the nest, it was supposed to be an action scene. And I changed everything. And they were very open. All my ideas were very open. They were very nice with me. And at this time, with Pitoff, if you remember, we thought, oh, we have a big pressure, they wanted some modification at the editing, but no, we were very free. We had the total freedom, almost like my own film. Yeah, absolutely. It was incredible because we were really scared. You know, Hollywood, the big studio, they're coming from a French background and where, where the director had the final cut. And um, yeah, the, the, the only issue was the uh, schedule and, and money. But the only thing we had to fight for uh, it was to, but incredibly, we, were, you know, we, we didn't have any producer on, on stage. Yeah. The boss was Tom Rothman, and I had a producer, Jorge Saralegi, he was from Cuba, Peter Rice from England, and so it was an international producer, and the French director and the French crew, they admit to have my French crew, Peter, the first AD, my script supervisor, Darius Conji, the DP, uh, my editor, Avishned, everybody, it was like a short film. <laughs> with a big budget. <laughs> From my point of view, um, I, I, we came in, um, I remember meeting with Danny Boyle. I believe we had a meeting with Danny Boyle about it. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know what the circumstances were there, but um, then we heard that it was you, and we were fans of Delicatessen and City of Lost Children, of course, and we were like, this is fantastic. This is really a bold choice, you know? And then we thought, we heard he doesn't speak English, and we thought, Oh, the studio is going to tear him apart. <laughs> we just assumed that, to this day, I thought that Fox was very, very mean to you. But they were kind, they were good. Yeah, 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 but you know, for us at this time, no, 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 no. Uh, we had some pressure at DDT, but for details. And we, I remember the first, uh, during the first test screening, we had one hundred uh, demand for modification. But it was just details. And at some time with my editor, we said, it's stupid, but let's try it. Oh, it's not so stupid. So I learned. And uh, after that, with my own film in France, I made some test screening to modify, to understand if we have a problem. So we learned a lot. And yet you haven't made another Hollywood movie. No, because I made Amélie. <laughs> <laughs> No, I turned up Harry Potter. Maybe it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The five or six, I don't remember. Yeah. 
But I, I was finishing a very long engagement. I was totally exhausted. And I was supposed to start the, the next week. So I said, no, no, thank you. And everything was ready. On Elliot, I had the freedom, but for Harry Potter, everything was on the table, the costume design, the production design, the casting, everything. So it, you know, it wasn't the same game. Mm -hmm. My uh, only regret, we couldn't work with Giger, because uh, for some reason, they didn't want to hire Giger. And I met him after, because I, I said during the promotion, I said beautiful things about him, and he was so happy. And we had an appointment in a very little hotel, uh, close to the Champs Elysees, and he made a selfie with me. I was totally stunned, because he was a hero. And uh, it was our reference, you remember. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. This film has uh, some of my favorite actors in it, and I'm especially uh, thrilled that you cast Brad Dourif who I just love in everything. Uh, talk a little bit about the cast, what cast was in place, what cast you brought in, uh, and, uh, and Raymond, how you came to the project, and congratulations, by the way, on uh, La Llorona. No, thank you. This guy was uh, very difficult. Why? Because <laughs> we play a lot of pool with Ron Perlman and him, and he never wants to give up. It was America versus France. <laughs> Never give up. At four o'clock in the morning, I pretended to lose because I was tired. <laughs> no, no, I had also the same freedom for the casting. We made a lot of tests with the whole Hollywood. It was a dream for me. And sometimes the studio said, no, nah, this guy, no, no, I'm not sure, but that's it. And they never insisted. Uh, if I didn't like someone, they never insisted. So it was uh, my casting. And Dominique Pinot, it was a request from Sigourney Weber. I saw her uh, lead down in front of the phone asking Dominique to come. He, he thought it was a joke. And no, it wasn't a joke. So I had my favorite actor in the film. And, uh, Santa Claus. But, but talk a little bit about finding some of these other actors. Uh, I love the fact that Dan Hedea is in this movie. And it's not necessarily the kind of film that Dan Hedea would have been seen in. Uh, Dan, Dan Hedea? Oh, Dan Hedea. I, I, I am sorry, I couldn't avoid to put some humor inside. <laughs> Maybe sometimes it's a little bit too funny, a little bit too kind of rather the dead of Dan Hedaya. <laughs> you know, it was supposed to be a big scene, very expensive, and I had to find a solution. And my solution when it takes the rain, some, <laughs> I remember during the screen, because the Fox wanted to cut that scene. They said it's too much, too funny. And I, I remember I said to Tom Rothman during the next text, text, uh, test screening, Let's ask the people about that scene. It was a, you know, a, a poker game. And for one time, it was in Las Vegas, everybody laughed, and they, they said, this is the best scene. And on the airplane, coming back to LA, I showed the paper to Tom Rothman, the boss, -da 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 -da. and the <laughs> test screening saved my scene. So sometimes it could be nice. For, it could be helpful for a director sometimes. Um, well, Raymond, tell, tell us a little bit about your experience getting started on this film. Uh, I heard that the underwater sequence was the first major set piece that was shot. That can't have been oh, that, an that easy was week. Really difficult. I think we spent six weeks underwater, and it was every day for like twelve hours. And it was a covered set. You would enter at one section. You would have to swim up to a hookah line where you would get air, and they would use light signals. And they'd say, "Okay, now swim to the back of the theater, toward like where the back of the theater is. There'll be a light there. And someone will give you air." So we would. <laughs> So they would use light cues, we, we would swim, and then light cue to cut. And at one particular time, we, we, we were underwater, and Leland Orser, who is one with the, with the chest burster that comes out, his diver went to the bathroom and didn't tell him. Oh. So Leland was going like this, which means I'm out of air, and he was about to drown. And I swam up to him, and he grabbed the air out of my mouth. And he, I, he was a little angry. <laughs> I was a little upset. And I, I remember, I don't even think I was supposed to be in the movie. Uh, I met Jean-Pierre Genet, Rick Pagano was the casting director, and I came in and I don't even think there was really a part for me. And, and Jean-Pierre, I was so excited to meet him because I love his films. And fortunately, you know, he, he like created this part of the Stefano, the character, to lead everyone through the ship, and that's how I ended up in Aliens. And I mean, how, how fortunate is that, that, that you know, there's, there's very few actors that are actually in an Aliens movie, so I, I, I was blessed. I, I, I also heard that, um, first of all, Winona Ryder was terrified of the water. Yeah, because when she was young, she had an accident, she, she almost died. 
So it was a, a real challenge for her to, to swim on the water. The water scenes were very difficult because they would put milk in the water to make it murky. And you couldn't really, you, 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 you couldn't, it was like having blurry vision. You couldn't see that well once you launched your mask underwater. And then, you know, we, we, we would swim like to lights. So it, it, it was frightening. It wasn't, and then the whole set was covered. You, you could not just swim up and escape. You, you had to just kind of wait till they brought air to you. So it, it was, it was dangerous. It was a bit dangerous. Not for me. I was outside. <laughs> And I could speak because they had some underwater speaker, but they couldn't answer. This is perfect. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> and then we were swimming in uniforms with boots on and carrying a gun. So imagine that. So. When I, when I uh, introduced the film, I called it uh, incredibly ambitious. And I want to just say that the, the design elements in this film are incredible, but the variety of things that had to be made uh, you know, obviously there's some CG with the, the aliens underwater, but so much of this is done with, you know, tangible creatures and miniatures, etc. And I, I, I find that design process uh, to be extraordinary. Can you guys talk a little bit about the things that you wanted to achieve, how, um, you know, what your process was in terms of design to execution? Uh, and let's talk first, I guess, about um, the, the, the spaceships and the miniatures and then the uh, alien creatures and, uh, and some of the other grotesque things that we see inside the ship. Just first of all, we have to say the production designer was Nigel Fells, an English guy. For, for the models, uh, we worked with Nigel and uh, Steve Cooper was the supervising art director. We worked a lot with Bill Bowes, who's become a production designer much since then. Uh, but the difference now, I mean, you see a lot of students and young people in the audience, all the stuff we dealt with was, as you mentioned, were, was tactile. So we were getting literally like blue line drawings from Jim Martin, one of the concept artists, and then uh, Bill Bowes put together a maquette of the Betty and one of the, uh, the Auriga out of just blue foam, and it'd be like, okay, here, go make this. And so then we would take it, we would draw up uh, vellum drawings. There was no rapid prototyping then, there was no digital modeling <clears throat> for the miniatures. So it was all hand built and the Betty was about five feet long in 30 second scale. We built an oversized piece for the, the coupling section. And then the Arigo was a 12 foot long, one 1,000 scale model. Um, I dealt with all the supervision at our studio and um, as art direction and such. And then my partner Ian dealt with all the supervisory work on set. We used to pair up work and we had some projects come in that I ended up taking over and he took over for me. But um, the thing that was cool was it literally, everything you see there was like hand built on the model side. We did some machining obviously, but it was a lot of hand sculpting and a lot of hand fabrication. It was like very old school. I mean, we, we started a miniature company when CG was starting, what, what a genius idea, but uh, <laughs> 90, 95. And by the way, we can buy the Betty, it's in prop store, and I think the cost is $80,000. Even me, I couldn't buy it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, and Let's, let, uh, let's talk about some of the designs from a conceptual level because the, uh, there was some back and forth over what the actual Origa was going to look like, right? Uh, right up until production started. It, it, was, it was a vertical design. Originally, it looked sort of like an outboard engine. Um, it, was, it was very vertical and had sort of a big sort of top and then it kind of tapered down. But I guess in 235, it was sort of yeah. just cut the... Yeah, but it was weird. I refused this design. <laughs> then, it, then it was changed to a, a horizontal design, and then that's that's how it, it ended up becoming that, what you saw on the screen. And but all the stuff was motion control, like the Betty's arms moving up and everything. One really quick detail that a lot of people don't know is when the maquette was built for the Betty, the um, the arms, the engines, they used. If you're familiar with Japanese anime model kits, the forearms of like Gundam or any of the big robots have these sort of big swept back pieces. And so the maquette that was built, those two engines were literally like model parts that were used for the two ends. And then we said, well, that was pretty cool. And then that's what, that's what it became. So if you look at it, it actually looks like sort of an anime kind of design. And how complicated is it to actually work with that on set? I mean, what's, what, what, what's the manpower that it takes to, to make shots like that happen? Uh, we had two uh, stages going in uh, Playa del Rey, one for shooting the Ariga and one for shooting the Betty. And as Matthew mentioned, there's motion control systems, which 
use computers to drive the uh, cameras and to drive the motion on the, on the models. So we could get very uh, slow exposures, because in order to hold depth of field on something that size to make it look like it's huge, to make the Arriga look as large as it was, we had to shoot at very slow frame rates, almost like shooting still photographs, and then uh, those are all uh, uh, come together. Uh, one funny thing, though, is that the by the time we got to stage with the Betty to shoot it, they had not yet finished building the interior of the Betty. So we just had blank windows, and Bill Bowes and I, one weekend, went down and started sketching what the inside of the Betty was going to look like because the schedule set was such that we had to shoot the model before they were shooting the interior. And uh, so we had to sort of cut holes out and build the inside, uh, sort of parallel to when the uh, full-size ones were being built. Um, but that was, that was probably the most sort of, I wouldn't say it was a challenging thing, but it was, a, it was an interesting moment because we had to sort of work parallel with uh, first unit. Uh, Pete, there's multiple um, visual effects companies involved in this movie. Tell us a little bit about how you figure out uh, who's going to take over which component and which which part of this was specifically your vision. Yeah, actually, there's a, a few companies. Just yeah, like three, yeah, three of them. Uh, there's there's a Dubois, which was a French company, who did the, most of the shots. We had one company who did a few uh, uh, 3D elements, like the the bullet and uh, stuff like that. And and um, and the aliens, of course, Blue Sky Studio were in New York. Um, yeah, so I mean, the whole thing was to work with 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 and for Jean Pierre. So I knew Jean Pierre for many many years, and I, I, I used to do commercials, and I worked from David Gallus and I'm in the city of other Steven. So my my main concern and, and and my proud was to do exactly what Jean Pierre had it in mind, I, and it was not very difficult because everything was toy bolded. Everything was very, very in place, so I just really had, I had to, to apply, I mean, whatever was to, to, to bring Jean-Pierre's vision. And, and so, and there's just a few CG things, just, it's, it's very, very, uh, the, the point was to, to, to be very organic. But the irony is we start with CG. I mean, all the, 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 the model uh, were, were uh, previous in 3D, so we had a crew. Uh, uh, on in, in in our facility, uh, who previews everything, to, to make sure that you know to facilitate the shooting and to be very precise precise with everything. And um, yeah, the, the uh, only thing which was funny is, uh, I mean, we did the the visual effects in a gy gypsy way, meaning meaning so, I brought my crew from from France, illegally here in the states. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> and, and so, and because we wrote the software, a, 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 a software for Jean Pierre at the time for the city of Ashiban, so we had an all in house software. So I brought my crew and our software, and then we rented the machine, we, we, we rented the computer, because at that time we, we couldn't make, you know, use PC. It was a second graphics computer, so very expensive computer. We, we couldn't bring that from France. It was, you know, the US <laughs> suitcase big enough. So, uh, um, and then, so we set up an office, uh, 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 really with no, no sign on it. <laughs> it was too illegal. And, and, and then every three months, you know, the crew has to leave the country. <laughs> so we went to Tijuana, and it's so just back and forth. So seriously, with the limo, we get a, a few guys were in a limo, pass through, through Tijuana tij 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 uh, 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 customs, <laughs> You turn and like five minutes later, back in the US. <laughs> that was the good old days. <laughs> so and, and we did most of the effects in, in a house like that. And 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 um, so we spent the, the whole year. I, I did the visual effects and also the second unit director. So I directed the uh, lot of we we had uh, several units. We have the, the blood and guts unit, which which has you know all the blood and guts like uh, all the, the, the stuff like that. Uh, we had the uh, uh, the miniature unit. That was uh, uh, my partner who took care of all the miniature shooting. And we had this amazing uh, 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 um, DP, uh, Rick Fischer, who did the uh, um, the right stuff. And so he did all the, uh, uh, the, the 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 light and everything. And so he had to connect with Darius because Darius was the particular on on the lighting. So he had to understand how Darius would light the miniature. And then he turned to be totally crazy to get you know the light without sh without shadow but with shadow. So the whole thing was he put he bought like black 
curtain and he lit with black curtain. So he was like aiming projectors, like thousands of watts of, of projector against black curtain in order to have this like a, a light coming from, from space. So it's a very specific, specific way and crazy way of, uh, of doing uh, things. Because it was frame by frame, so it was like a, it, could, it could have melts <laughs> the, the, the miniature, right? He <laughs> did melt the miniature. He melted it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So imagine you've got black wrap, which is which is heavy uh, gauge aluminum foil that's covered in black and absorbs light. And then in order to get enough exposure, you need to point uh, lots of light. So 420k. So you have thousands of watts of light pointing at these black wraps, and then you surround the model with that. So you basically made an oven around the miniature. <laughs> and then the miniature was, would get so hot that we actually had to put uh, tubes and air conditioning in the model itself to keep it cool enough when we were shooting it because would, it would take hours to shoot a pass on a model. So um, yeah, that was a, I forgot about that part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also one thing, if I remember well, the, I mean, the, the, the studio was, was the uh, uh, um, uh, Howard Hughes hangar. Yeah. And it was built on the, on the marshland, so the, the 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 ground was not stable, and the motion control was not aligned up, and it was like dancing or something. So we had sometimes we had the mats where well, post production the mat were not lined up exactly mm -hmm. with, with the model, so we had to. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, we were having like literally seismic disturbances from one day to the next, where the the motion control system, which has to be very precise, would be out of alignment the next day, and so the pieces of film would not fit together, and which would require us to do more passes. So. Yeah, and all this was like, well, like, a, coming like 18, 20 passes? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So, did, did, uh, so the whole look of the, of the, uh, the, the, the miniature was, was done in post-production to combine all the different passes. Yeah, so imagine if you're shooting the, the beauty light, the fill light, a matte pass, each individual uh, light on the model itself, all of these needed to be shot separately and then uh, uh, combine together uh, in post in the composite. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, let's talk about the, the alien design because it's really extraordinary what, what you guys came up with in this film. Uh, start. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that you bring back the alien queen from, from Aliens, what that process was like, and then how, uh, how, how you guys work together to design what was going to be this final, you know, um, hybrid alien human being? Well, um, you know, for Tom Woodruff and I, um, uh, having five years earlier done um, Alien 3, uh, which was kind of a, a return to a single creature, um, to be given this kind of a playground to expand it and actually explore the, you know, a little bit more of the morph part of the xenomorph. Um, it was a dream come true for us, and then, as, as I mentioned, you know, we're already we're huge fans of Jean Pierre, and then to get to work with Pitoff as well on set in the second unit, we just had a blast. We had a blast oh, yeah. because these gentlemen really embraced um, the uh, practical aspect of things. It was at a time when um, you know digital was really surging forward. We had Jurassic Park, and we were during the production of Alien Three. My company was also prepping Starship Troopers. And it was like a night and day difference. Starship Troopers, um, you know, they were very much into the practical stuff, or the digital stuff, and they wanted as little <coughs> practical as possible. So, you know, we were just not not given quite the resources, but this was the opposite. So it was, it was great fun for us. And then also the job um, had so many different facets to it. We had, we had eggs, we had uh, face huggers, again, we had chest bursters, we had warriors, uh, xeno warriors, we had the newborn to design. The clones um, were, were my favorite. I'm pointing at you, Ian. Um, <laughs> um, that, that was one of my favorite design projects. So it afforded us the ability to bring in really great artists, and, and we were able to design as a cohesive unit, bring stuff to Jean-Pierre, um, who had a very specific vision about things, but yet an open mind about, about, about where we should take things. And um, I think for us, like one of the more interesting aspects of it was that because these aliens were tainted with human, you know, the whole thing was she's, she's a human with alien DNA and they are aliens with human DNA and then the newborn has, you know, a weirder, more decrepit and freakish mix of, of it all. Um, 
but the alien warriors themselves, we, uh, we softened the look of them, we softened the biomechanical look. Um, and then Darius uh, Kanji came in and really said, I, I have an approach for this that I wanna take to make them really look spectacular but I need you to put much more slime on them. I need, I need slime. So we'd go like, okay, we'd apply our normal slime. He's like, no, 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 it's all coming off. We need it, oh, you need it like peanut butter. <laughs> so we mixed clear slime that was like as thick as peanut butter and we'd smear it on so it would hang there. And then he would, wherever he could, he would erect a, like a cage of fluorescent tubes in all these weird chaotic patterns around it to get all those weird highlights and kicks on it. And that's part of why this, uh, this stuff looks different than any other alien film. Uh, but there was a lot of experimenting, there was a lot of, um, it was a very exciting process uh, for us because, because the, you guys were not too precious with everything, it was not too, you were willing to take risks. And, uh, and I think that when I watch it now, I haven't seen it in, in many years, uh, but uh, when I watch it now, I think, wow, we really did, uh, we really did push it, you know, for, for that time. Especially the ending, it wasn't easy for you to have the newborn wood going on the space. And uh, because it was supposed to be in the first script, to be the ending, the death of Dan and Daya by the fall. And I changed for something more simple, because for money reason and they had to finish the ending with the newborn going to the space. Yeah, we were, we were building the Dan Hedaya death. We had a, a bunch of parts. You, you can see it uh, tested. I plug my YouTube channel whenever I get the chance. <laughs> but we have a YouTube channel, Studio ADI's channel. You can see a whole bunch of behind the scenes of resurrection stuff are, are, um, are testing. But we, we were testing with the Dan Hedaya makeup and um, jean Pierre came to us, he's like, I think it was because Titanic went over budget, right? Did, did yeah. Titanic went over budget, so we had to make some cuts. And he's like, we can't have the death scene that we were, and it's a spectacular death, the way Dan Hedaya was gonna die. So let's just apply that to the newborn. And we were like, oh man, we've got some work to do. Uh, but it was fun, it was a blast, it was the right decision. Do you remember, Peter, we wanted to shoot the, the blood, some piece of sausages. We were ready to have a small camera, uh, you in a ladder, me shooting underneath, you know, as we could make in France. And no, we had a crew with 40 people with the specialists of the sausages from ladder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We were surprised because every, everything was amazing. For example, for the, the spider, uh, a specialist of insect came. Uh, insect are my business. And it had maybe 100 spider on my desk. And when I said, but we will have to kill the spider, he became white because you know you couldn't do that, and he found uh, a spider death in a natural way. <laughs> I swear, true <laughs> story. Well, I have to say, as uh, each each one of these films has amazing uh, visual design and direction, and they each have such beautiful scores, and I am just amazed at how consistently <laughs> effective and gorgeous the music is. Uh, so John, let's talk about uh, how how you got the gig, and uh, and then tell us a, a little bit about your process because I, I've seen some things where you're doing very unusual work with uh, with relatively uh, uh, standard musical instruments, but used in a very unique way. Well, um, getting the job, I had seen City of Lost Children and Delicatessen, and admired them beyond pretty much anything I admired. And um, I had a friend who just uh, uh, said, you know, keep sending my music in. And, and somehow it came across your desk, I think, right? And, um, and we had a meeting, and we spoke, and uh, that was it. But we just get go got going. It was an incredibly exciting experience for me. And I love hearing what everyone, all these other aspects of the film, because, I mean, it felt like that. I mean, we were, it was such a big scope and such a big range and such amazing scores, the scores uh, of, of Goldsmith and Horner and Goldenfall before. Um, and it was such an honor to be, at, to have that path to you know, go on from there. Um, I remember going down to the set and seeing the pool and, and thinking, you know, I've been working so hard and then seeing the pool and go, okay, I can work harder. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, uh, you know, and, 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 and Jean-Pierre, we were, we was, was 
so enthusiastic and so much fun to work with, there was not a lot of language that we could get between us, and so it was a lot of body language that we would just, you know, if something wasn't working, we would go down, if it was, it was good, we'd have hands up, and, and we, we managed to, to create communication that was probably, in a way, better for music, because you don't need a bunch of words with music. We, we're working outside of language, and that's, that's what I love most about my work. And tell us about the instruments you chose to use. Well, I, there's a very, you know, uh, traditional orchestra in the sense of, 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 a, of a large orchestra. I think it was about 90. Um, there was, I think, about 48 tracks of synthesizers. There was um, uh, a lot of aleatoric uh, 20th century techniques used on more traditional instruments, super balls. I think a lot of people have seen that video of the super ball. But we used things like that a lot. Rubbing the base of the, the skin of a, of a large drum, playing... Um, uh, 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 stringed instruments in different ways. Sometimes the horns, we would just have the, the horns, French horns, we'd have just blow air through them and just make strange, almost breathing sounds um, to, to, to just create this uneasiness through things. And we, we recorded the music at Sony Studio, and the day of my birthday, 120 musicians play La Marseillaise, and <laughs> happy birthday to you. I remember the goosebump. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to ask about a few of my favorite scenes in the film. Uh, there are many, but my absolute favorite is when the aliens uh, devise their own escape yeah. from within the cell. I love that scene so much. Uh, tell us about uh, where the idea came from and how it uh, how complicated it was to actually shoot. When they escape from the hall? When they, when they have to kill Ask the third Peter alien. He was the director of the second unit and yeah. he made that scene. <laughs> but yes. I, I modify a lot the script. I put a lot of detail. For example, the stupid uh, gag. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember. The, the, the cube of, uh, of whiskey. Right. You know, the spider. Uh, because it wasn't my script and I am used to write my own script, it was a challenge for me to bring one idea per scene. At this time, it was a little bit my thing, you know? And we rewrote the ending. We wrote five different endings. So uh, I was a little bit uh, a co writer. <laughs> but uh, ask a bit yeah, of so Peter, yeah. Tell us about shooting that scene. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the scene, I wanted to, to make something very organic and very vague, like uh, uh, shaky. Because the, the, one of the main problems was the, 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 the alien was not able to, to move very fast. And, and, and of course, uh, and we had just. Uh, an, just the, uh, uh, the, the space was, was very, very tiny, and so to, uh, to um, make some, uh, I wanted to make something very, very uh, <coughs> speed fast and almost like a blur. So, uh, so uh, everything was shaking. The alien was shaking. The camera was shaking, and to get uh, to get just the expression. So my, my, my thing was to get the expression of the, of the alien and the action, and the rest was blurs, 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 blurs. Well, it's a wonderful scene because you know later we, we see. The aliens that are uh, the, the, the the newborn that has a lot of expressive elements, but I'm guessing working with just the, the the main alien creature design, you get a lot of understanding of sort of how their brain works just from the way it's shot. Yeah, of course. But it, it, but before that, you know, before uh, uh, shooting the alien, I made a lot of research of animals because my thing was to to apply uh, uh, as much as animalistic behavior. To the uh, to to the aliens, in order to, to bring some life, and not just try to an animation like move right or head, but uh, try to bring a, a substance and 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 a different layers for the aliens, and, and so that that was my guy for every scene uh, I did, and every shot was trying to to, to to feel what animal was in inside at this at this moment inside the alien, and I really went through uh, the, uh, when we were in pre in, in, in pre production through footage, and I had hours and hours of footage of any kind of, any, of animals where, where they were, I mean, I, I, my mix was between insects and feline. So I made a, uh, like a bunch of, of uh, footage of feline and movement of felines, like big cats, lions, tiger, and all that, and cockroaches, and, and because to, to me, the aliens were a mix of the two. They, they, they had some very feline type of movements, but they were like, like insects. So uh, I tried to bring the two, the two together. And, and from, from my point of view, um, what's, what, what, when we were discussing looking at storyboards, 
I was very worried because um, this was the first time in my experience that we were like having to, like that scene with Brad Dourif looking at the alien, he's looking back at him, they're mimicking each other all that. You just, the camera is just laying on that alien. He's just sitting there on the alien. And, you know, in the past, you're into quicker cuts on, you know, um, on, on these creatures. So uh, we were very concerned about, about like, because they're guys in a suit, Tom Woodruff Jr. wearing a suit, right? Um, and he's great, um, but there are times when uh, you have to like give him as much help as possible. So shaking that camera around and, and uh, but Darius's lighting was was beautiful too. But that is where with this one when it, when when I like listen to fan chat groups and stuff, they do refer to this as the beast um, style of of that's what the alien is. They call it a beast. So it's interesting when you say that. About, about going for that animalistic kind of quality. That's, uh, and it's a little controversial too. Yeah. Because you have those, those fans from the 79 alien who you know, want nothing to do with the beast mode, and then you have others going, why, wow, they were cool, they were awesome, you know, so. <laughs> the newborn was very difficult to shoot because image it was a torso, the head, the heart, and a big pool in his ass, <laughs> and a jeep with four wheels and 18 puppeteurs behind. So it was a big manufacturing, it, it wasn't easy to shoot. Imagine now, it's so easy with the digital. You, you, know, you ask the people behind the computer, they do everything you want. But at this time, it was very difficult. And it was a big co collaboration between us. And, and that newborn had, um, uh, it was heavy. It was a big, heavy, you know, because he's eight feet tall, so his torso is larger than a human torso. And that's where all the hydraulic mechanisms were. Um, uh, you know, just to get him into places, get him inside that sack, that birth sack, when he comes up out of that, you know, was, that was all a challenge. I think that day when we had, um, we had the queen and the, and yeah. the, the newborn going, I, we had at least 20, 25 puppeteers. Yeah, it was all. amazing, yeah, it was oh. 20, what? It was 25, yeah, there was like 30 or something. Yeah, yeah I've never been involved in a bigger puppeteering shot than that, or sequence. And he was uh, the conductor. So it was yes. incredible because you know it was real time. I mean, there, there's no there's no compositing or whatever. It, everything was in camera. So the the birth of the of the newborn was everything. You know, he did. I mean, he was like, like a really like a conductor and, and, and directing the, the. I think it was thirty puppeteers for every. Let's call it forty. Yeah, yeah. that's forty. <laughs> yeah, almost a hundred. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, it's a round number. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a detail. There is a one shot, and the, the newborn bites, you know, and Simone has a reaction. But it, in fact, it was an accident, yes. uh, something wrong. And Simone made a film with gorilla, gorilla in the fog or something. You know yes. what I mean? <laughs> so she she remember that shooting, and she knew exactly the reaction when the the animal is could be brutal. Mm. Yeah, that's another great thing. It's like you know when when something goes wrong. That's one of the strengths of practical effects, as opposed to digital. That there are unplanned, happy accidents that happen, and if you, and and for the director to recognize that, and go, that's cool. Uh, that's a big thing for us. That 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 makes you feel encouraged that uh, that you're getting something organic and that you're not pre-planning it to death so that it looks like a, it doesn't look alive anymore. Yeah, and, and I, just, I just I just remember when I died in the movie. It was two puppeteers. Each one had an arm, and the hands were covered in KY jelly. <laughs> and they just slapped me in the face. <laughs> yeah, the, I was off screen going, "You really got to smack them hard, otherwise it <laughs> yeah, won't there, look." There, there were multiple takes. I remember that. <laughs> and the newborn was very interesting because they designed the the, the, the guy with a lot, lot of lot of animation, facial animation. In, in order to be, to be able to, to, to give an expression, a physical expression, you know, almost a human expression to the, uh, to the newborn. And it was the, um, uh, what we were going for there was a wide range of expressions so that you could see the change of expression because our thinking in talking with Jean-Pierre was that he was like a new, he was like a toddler. He was like a child and one moment he'd be, he'd be happy or sad and then the next minute he'd be enraged and, but he was deadly and, and, and very dangerous. So you, some of the most interesting shots to me are like when he's looking at Winona and he's trying to get at her and then he kind of goes, uh, like, yeah, I'm bummed I can't, and then he's pissed again, you know. Those are the fun moments. 
Uh, we, we had some reproaches from uh, critic about the eyes because it was new on the edges. But with our eyes, it could be boring after a while because you need to go further and further. I, I think that the design of the newborn is amazing. And I, I particularly love the fact that we actually feel some emotion when the alien dies. I mean, that's the first time in these films that you care you know, almost as much for the alien in that moment uh, as you do for the people surviving. Uh, in fact, I think this is maybe the most emotional alien film because that kind of uh, sort of pathos goes throughout the movie in various scenes, also when the newborn kills the queen. It's a wonderful thing that is new, I think, to this, to this universe. Um, I wanted to ask about um, uh, so, so some of the smaller scenes, too, because one of my, one of my favorite scenes is uh, a dialogue scene with J.E. Freeman and Brad Dourif and Sigourney Weaver early in the film where basically J.E. Freeman, who is amazing in this film, uh, basically outlines sort of what they're doing and it's the scene where you really understand who Sigourney is, at the, who Ripley is at this point. Um, t tell us a little bit about, in the midst of such a huge production, directing a much smaller scene. Uh, you know, I love actors, and uh, Sigourney Weaver was a theater actress. So we were sit down and we, she loved to replay the action scene by, you know, comedy scene. And it was a real pleasure to work with her. With Anna Ryder, it was something different. She was, uh, uh, I, I remember when she had, had to react in front of the newborn. The newborn was, wasn't ready at this time. So I tried to explain to her how the, the newborn will be. And she said, no, 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 don't be concerned. I will make a, a, a variety. And she made it. <laughs> it looks terrible, it looks stupid. <laughs> and at the editing, everything worked. <laughs> and the day after, I said, it, you were amazing, everything works. And she said, I do just my job. <laughs> <laughs> On the <other> approach. <laughs> Danny Daya, for example, he, he was used to say, Jean-Pierre, tell me faster or slower, it would be enough. <laughs> American actor. But Sigourney was different. She was, she was in pleasure to, to speak and to talk. And, and this film also really brings to fruition uh, uh, Giger's eroticism, I think, in, his, in the artwork that inspired the first film. There's a lot of a sort of erotic direction. Oh, yes, and Sigourney uh, was used to say, nothing can shock a French. So <laughs> we push the erotic aspect. I have, I have an anecdote, it's a scoop. Um, I, I'm sure you remember. Uh, we were making something sexual between Sigourney and the newborn, and I said, uh, don't go too far, because the next week it will be worse. And she said, okay, first me. So the next week arrived, and I remember, I remind her, so you told me you will be ready to make something more. And she said, okay. Uh, I asked her, do we want I fire everybody on set? No, no, it's okay. And you know, the alien has two jaws, you know. And she made a blowjob at the second show. Can you believe it? <laughs> and nobody saw that. Never. I am the only one. Even my editor, he was shocked. <laughs> it's somewhere in a negative, in a box, in a bunker somewhere. And nobody will see that. Never. <laughs> John, can you talk about composing some of the, the music that's specifically a p sort of part of bringing out the sexuality? Well, we did talk a lot about that, and um, I think the first scene that we spent a lot of time on was when she is first waking up, breaking through the sort of silk, and and and, and, and her movements are very sensual and erotic. And um, we talked a lot about opera. We talked a lot about um, I think impressionist music, and um, and just bringing that into the score probably for the first time in the series. Hopefully, we got that across, um, representing that type of emotion, you know. Um, I, I don't know any other way to say it. It's just, it was, it was uh, we, we talked a lot, we, we really got into that, about how do, how do we make this, and how do we pull that off to make um, eroticism functional against the horror? And something very important, during the first meeting, I told him I would like, if it's possible, to, to keep the few notes from the first one. 
because for me it was alien. The two, uh, what, four notes maybe? Well, we, we recorded two cues, note for note from Jerry Goldsmith's original score. We just, we, we got this, we got the scores and we, we recorded them and they're in the film. Uh, having discussed the underwater scene, Raymond, can you talk us through what was the next most challenging setup for you? <laughs> it, it was really difficult to hold your breath for the long takes. Uh, like, on no, seriously, we had to train uh, ahead of time uh, using a swimming pool, and, and I, I was in Vancouver shooting the X-Files. I was playing the Chupacabra, so at night I would just swim laps, and I would just try to stay underwater like as long as I could. So I mean that, that was the hardest part was you know getting it was it, the, it was heated, but after a while when you're in there for so long you get acclimated to it then it gets cold, and you know we, we spent a long time in the water, and you know and then, and then the alien the alien kept sinking, <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't swim, who knew? <laughs> right, Tom in the suit. Oh, was, was a stuntman in a yeah. suit, yeah. and he would just sink to the floor, <laughs> and just lay there, so they would have to go retrieve him. And after a while, they admit that they pee in the swimming pool. Uh, oh, yeah. That's what kept you warm. <laughs> what, what, what else was complicated for you as an actor? Well, um, you know, every actor has a different, um, you know, physical ability. So, you know, like Winona was terrified of the water. And, uh, you know, a couple of the other actors, it, it was really hard on them, you know, uh, just, just the practical shooting and, you know, getting everybody in the shot. and. You know, setting up the blocking, and then, then sometimes you would swim to your mark. You would get there, and there'd be no air inside the tank, so you have to turn around and swim back out. And like, there's no air, and it's like, oh, okay, we'll replace it. <laughs> what, what? So, uh, how, what, what does Tom think about having to take the alien suit in the water? Um, well, Tom, uh, we, there was very little of the actual alien in the water. There was the, the moment where um, the alien grabs uh, Kim? Was that yeah, Kim Flowers. Yeah, Kim Flowers. And uh, drags her backwards. And that was a big like ratchet underwater ratchet pull where there was a, 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 a rope that went to a pulley. And, and they were dragged back about like 30 feet or so back into the darkness. And um, the... Uh, uh, you know, and then a guy would have to swim out. You know, because you can't have him. You can't have a diver waiting in the back. You know, in the, even though the shot was all soft focus, that was the final funny thing. That it's like, you know, he had to go 30 feet, but it was all out of focus. But Tom got Tom would have to go out there and sit there and uh, wait patiently for the guy to come and give him the um, the air. And uh, he was uh, he he was left. He, he wasn't left there through any incompetence or anything. It's just that. When you do it five or six times, it starts to wear on you, right? But he did. Tom did get hypothermia in that um, in that instance, and he had to be taken to um, to the to a nearby hotel. Sigourney was was like, "Your lips are blue. Get this guy to," and they put him in a hot tub and all that stuff. But but we discovered that the that when you put uh, an alien suit in the water, it looks terrible because there's no reflectivity when, on an object when it goes underwater, so all that shine goes away, and then it just looks like a crappy rubber suit. So there's very little, um, there's very little practical uh, alien underwater. Let's, let's talk about the costumes, because uh, this is my favorite Ripley costume, as I was mentioning, we have it on display in the exhibit. Um, but I've also seen sketches from Mark Carroll that yeah, at the beginning I thought, I, I asked Macao if he would have wanted to, to work with me, but Macao hates the sun and he didn't drive at this time. So LA wasn't for him, definitely. <laughs> and no, he said, uh, if I don't have the total freedom, I, I don't want to come. Probably he thought he would be fired after a few weeks. And so he, he just came to design the, the look of the character. And in fact, we can recognize just one or two details. And Bob um, remade the costume because he was used to make some uh, big action film in Hollywood. But uh, no, no, we can recognize. And there is another anecdote. We Sigourney was very picky with the costume. We fly f to New York to present a lot of different versions, and she refused everything. And one day we proposed the costume, and she said, "No, no, I don't want that." The first day of the shooting, she saw Kim Flowers with her costume, and she said, "This is the costume I want." And I said, Sigourney, we offered you, you said no, I want this costume. So we had to remake the costume very quickly. That's the reason in the film, Kim Flowers 
cries before jumping on the water, just to have her not with the rest of the band because the costume wasn't ready. And sometimes a technical problem, a technical issue gives you a, a, be, a, be, a better idea. That's the reason she cries alone, because, you know, just because the costume wasn't ready. But <laughs> what I like about that story is that it answers this question of Ripley just had this amazing leather outfit just kind of hanging around on the ship. But the fact that it was actually designed for someone who would have brought it with her from another ship makes a lot of sense. What was Ripley's original costume supposed to be? I don't remember, but it was nothing. Yeah. This one is very nice. And by the way, it's on the small exhibition, I suppose, in yeah. the exhibition. Um, one, one other thing I want to I talk about is the great, um, the, the chest burster death uh, you know, with Leland and, and J.E. Freeman, what a fantastic moment in the film. It's very cool, very sweet. <laughs> it's so violent, I'm ashamed. <laughs> but it's amazing for two reasons. It's, it's amazing when the alien bursts through both of them, but it's that shot down the throat is also quite yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk, talk a little bit about that from a design and execution standpoint. I, I don't remember. I don't remember where you you did the the, the the mouth. I don't remember. Yeah, you. Um, this was one of the fun things you gave us, right? Like I wanted to. We've never seen inside a human body when uh, you know an alien is bursting out. So we wanted to. We're like that is cool, right? Like that's a that's a great. Like I don't know why the camera's in there, but that's cool. <laughs> so we we had our um, our chest burster from from you know that we've been using you know for all the different you know pop outs and all that stuff. And, um, and and then we had to build an oversized kind of esophagus, you know, leading down into wherever it's going. Um, and it was just a big, um, like about a ten, eight or ten foot long um, silicone tube uh, that we had suspended by. Um, uh, I think we had clear uh, acrylic rings that held it up because you don't want shadows. You know, if you want to backlight it, don't want shadows. And we just had the creature on a long pole. And as I recall, there was a was it a snorkel lens or was it maybe we had to make a slot in the in the top of it so that you could run a snorkel lens through it. You That's probably what it was. Snorkel lens. Yeah. Snorkel yeah. And then we had to get in there and grease it all up and all that stuff. And so you just have to shoot that like you know twenty times to get the right little part of it. Uh, but it was a blast. We also had a um, I don't know if it's in the film. I don't think it's in the film. We had a we had a chest cavity. It must have been um, when. Uh, What's his name, Michael? Um, yeah, but it, he did not work. It didn't work. It was yeah, you fucked up. We you fucked up. We <laughs> fucked it up. We, we did That's the reason in Big Mac, I, I shot the, a bullet in the brain uh, because I, we missed this shot. Oh, did you do that? OK, yeah. 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 Well, it, I'm, I'm glad it. Who, who did the bullet in the brain? Was that a practical? Uh, some, some French. Some French guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start uh, opening this up. Who wants to jump in? Yes, over here. First of all, thank you all for coming. It's an amazing film. Um, I have a question for Jean Pierre. The what, what do you think it, it takes for a director to have prepared so that when he gets on set, he's he's ready to t tackle a scene? What is it, what does the director have to do to prepare so that he's ready to tackle a scene when he gets to the set? I believe in working hard, so I make a wall storyboard for every, everything. The whole thing was storyboarded. The whole thing, every scene, even when they speak. <laughs> so it's reassuring. It doesn't mean you respect the storyboard. If you find something better at the last moment, you change. But the storyboard is like a freeway. If you want to take a small road in the middle of the country, you can. But if you are lo lost, you can take again, uh, take back the, the freeway. And it's very good for everybody to have a guide because you know it's very precise. Yeah, the whole script was storyboarded. Yeah. I have a copy of it, it's really cool. <laughs> 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 this is for John. Uh, do you have a specific composer that uh, inspired you for this, or is there a piece or a movement that might have led you to the exact? There's a specific composer, a piece of music that. Well, I think I think Jerry Goldsmith set the tone mm. for the series more than anybody. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, very abrasive 
and confusing tension in Elliot Goldenthal's score, which is amazing, and obviously the, 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 the propulsion of Horner's. So I think you have to go forward, you know, having known those scores so well, I think that there has to be an homage to that you have to come back to it. And I hope I, hope I got that across. Um, but I think, you know, um, you keep that somewhere tucked in your brain, then you go forward as yourself. That's, that's what creating is. Is that... Make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I just, I, was there somebody, uh, Ravel or uh, uh, Mahler, anybody? I mean, I'm always, I think at the time, maybe, I, I, probably Bartok, probably Concerto for Orchestra sort of sits in my head, just ruminates, maybe maybe a little bit with, with Call's theme, maybe thinking of a, I, I, that, and music for strings for percussion and chalice as well are two pieces that I, I just, here constantly in my head because I've heard them, but I just adore them so much. So, so maybe Bartok if I had to go one place. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Does anyone want to talk about working with Ron Perlman? <laughs> Ron Perlman, he had to make a lot of tests because the studio wasn't, you know, wasn't sure, and he he came with the the, the scar with the costume. And I think he came three times to convey the, the, the studio. And we shot, the first day we shot when he threw the knife on the leg of uh, Dominic Pinot. And they, they were very nice because they saw the dailies before me and they came to say, he's great. So it was reassuring for everybody. Rob Perlman is the nicest man and really funny. <laughs> really funny guy, but the nicest man. And he plays pool, pool as well. American team, Ron and I against Jean Pierre, and whatever French guy he had with him, and we, 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 would, we would beat their ass. We did it for America. And Do Dominic and I used to play soccer on the basketball court on the set when they weren't shooting, and it was just me and him, and he hated America. He was like, this is not, a, this is not football. <laughs> And you know the famous anecdote when Sigourney threw the ball from the eye, she, she made it for real, no visual effect. Mm -hmm. And Pitoff suggests, maybe we can make another day. I thought she was ready to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no, 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 no. The thing is, because when I saw the, uh, on the monitor that the, the ball was leaving the top of the frame and going down, and I said, okay, we, we could cheat the, the, the path of the ball so the ball stays in frame and don't go in and out of the frame. And Sigone told me, you don't do that. But Sigone, we can maybe move, move the frame. No, 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 you don't do that. If you do this, I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. Yes. I was curious about the alternate ending shot. Oh, <laughs> yeah, because the alternate ending. In the original script, they were getting dragons flying above some cliffs or something very expensive and a little bit silly. So uh, we wrote uh, maybe five different endings. And I, I couldn't remember, but the, the last one was cheaper. And, uh, and when they discover the, 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 the earth by the window, I have to say it's a retake shot in New York and uh, with an air rider as a wig, <laughs> and I can tell. And it was a, it's a little bit cheap, but it's okay because Pitoff uh, found the beautiful stock footage and we saved the situation. But it was, yeah, at the last moment, yeah. Well, and also the, the, the effect of the, I, I saw some of the behind the scenes of how you pulled the alien creature through the window. Uh, you would talk a little bit about the, how difficult that was to design. Uh, well, the the newborn's death was um, done in stages. So you know, a, as Jean Pierre says, everything was thoroughly boarded out, and that's a great thing when in pre-production you can everybody can sit around and look at the at the board, suggest new ideas, make tweaks, uh, and then figure out what your uh, your mo is going to be. Uh, but I think you know the first stuff we had was the was the newborn. Uh, we had multiple bodies that we built. Uh, the newborn, the hero newborn that was the hydraulic guy, you know, against the window, you know, looking back at her, and we would just slam him up against the window, and that was nice positive movement because it was 
very strong, sturdy hydraulics, you know, just to get him and pulling himself forward, and we would get the performance of him. You know, we'd have the guy shaking the big uh, pole that was coming out of his ass, um, <laughs> and, and you know, get that, all that. Uh, I think Mark Vignello, right there, right? You were there on set, right, Mark? And you were probably one of the beefy young guys that we had shaking. I know you did it on Starship Troopers, you probably did it on that. But, um, and then once we got that moment, and, and then you cut around to the other side, uh, where it was, there was the digital enhancement of the of the of the body being sucked out. I think we did have a um, we did have a section of the body that had a, a piece of uh, monofilament in it with a, a big you know plug in it that we could pull the silicone uh, uh, yeah, out yeah, through exactly, the, yeah. right and shake that. And then we were trying to shake everything and make it cool. And then you cut back inside. You cut to reactions of Sigourney. And by the way, I think it's Sigourney's emotions that really amplify the newborn's emotions, which, make, which, which, are, which is, you know, it always hinges on, on the people around the actors and how they're reacting to the, to the puppet. Um, and then we had our, you know, a couple of different, um, uh, you know, rod puppeted bodies and stuff that would start the process and an arm would disappear down, you know, through the back of the hole and, you know, bit by bit it was all coming. And then we had this the great, hilarious um, uh, gut spill, you know, and, and I, I don't know, one of you two, Put the camera down low so the guts just gush out. Uh, you know that that's so pleasing, to, you know, for us because we just love all of that over-the-top uh, fun stuff. Um, and then ultimately, it gets down to just the skull, which was its own little setup that was bolted to the to the to the glass, you know, uh, to the plexiglass window, and it ha it had a um, <clears throat> skin that you could pull from the inside, leaving a segmented fiberglass uh, <coughs> core that you could skull that you can then you know, pull, so everything's actually happening, and then it was seamlessly blended in, in, at certain moments, you know, from, from one piece to the other. And then cutaways, cutaways are your friend, you know, uh, we had lots of cutaways. The, the, the one thing that disappointed me was when we got that news that Titanic was running over budget so we had to cut, is that we had a rod puppet of the newborn that was like a one-third scale that we were going to use a little bit more to show him kind of moving around. And I always felt, uh, at least, you know, because in my mind, that was the plan. And then when that went away and we didn't have the money to finish the puppet and shoot the puppet and comp it and all that kind of stuff, um, it kind of became, uh, to me, it was, it was a little limited in, it, in the way it moved. It would sort of appear here and there. But now, in retrospect, when I look at it, it's a little like, the, uh, like Ridley Scott's Alien, where, where, you know, they had a problem with that suit that it was not very mobile and Ridley had to kind of change the way he shot it, so it would sort of just already be there, and it was like a surprise thing, so it, it gave you the feeling of stealthiness, and you know, so people could look around like, where the hell is this giant thing, which you know, you probably in real life see, but there it is, you know, in your face, so I, I was quite pleased with it tonight. Uh, on the, so, sorry, on the very little anecdote, but it's something interesting. It was shot in 45 millimeters, so we had to cut the negative, and at the end, when the origa blows, you have the empty uh, corridor. <laughs> and if you pay attention, in one corridor, you have the time to see the crew. They are supposed to be in the Betty. They arrive at the end of the corridor. Why? Because the negative editor made a mistake for two frames. Or probably she thought, oh, it's an empty corridor. We don't care. But no, look, the, the, the crew is alive one more time. <laughs> Um, I want to hear about the inspiration for some of the wonderfully bizarre character moments, like Winona Ryder with the boxing gloves, or uh, Dan Hedaya eating the lemon peel. Yeah. So you're asking for some of the great character moments, what inspired, for instance, Dan Hedaya with lemon peel, or Winona Ryder with the boxing gloves? The gloves, I don't remember, but it was an idea from uh, Dan Hedaya to eat lemons, and I said, be careful, because it's very... Uh, Peter, you know, it's lemon. And then, no, no, no problem. He was sick. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult for him. But he started, he has to finish. <laughs> Too much. He was very professional. <laughs> yes? We 
talk about the other component of the newborn design that had to be censored. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a model in my office, and everybody sees that every day. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a weird thing. Well, let's discuss what that it, is. It, it, was, uh, it had a penis. It had a penis, and, 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 and the penis was kind of nestled inside a vagina. And we actually did articulate the penis. Remember, we... we... But in fact, it's like him. <laughs> so we did, we did have that, and that was going to be that on that, you know, we're like, we don't know where this scene is going between the, the newborn and the alien. This is crazy, right? It's, it's a, but the, the sexuality is, is built into it uh, through the, the script and through Giger, but we, did, we, you know, we have a French director, so we don't know where this thing is going. Um, and, um, and, and eventually, uh, I believe what you uh, said to me one, at one point, Jean-Pierre, you said, it was just too much, and I am French. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. How did you do rehearsals, uh, particularly for the inter uh, underwater sequence? In fact, with the stunt coordinator, we made some kind of rehearsal on the floor, and it was really stupid to, to <laughs> see the people pretending to, to swim. No, my worst nightmare was the set was big, but not big enough to have the line, because when everybody was swimming, it was packed from the beginning to the ending of the set. And I thought, oh my God, it, will, it won't be possible to stay one minute and a half or two minutes in the same two small set, and we did. But I, I couldn't sleep during the five weeks <laughs> because it was very scary. And at the end, it works. But sometimes you have a ball uh, on the corner to figure out it was a, a corner of the room. No, it was just a ball. I cheat a lot for this thing. And the milk and the dust helps because it's more confusing. But you, you don't see, it's all, they always take the same path, the same way. Yeah, it was, we block it out off just above the ground. We block it out, then we go in the water, and they would use light cues. And again, like underwater, there was um, furniture, there was sets. So, so it, was, it, was, you know, it was kind of tight trying to swim around everything. It looks roomier than it actually was. But it was like 12 feet deep. But Raymond was very good underwater because you can see you open the, the, the hatch or the door. And I sit there, I wait, I'm holding my gun. I think it was three minutes. Yeah. He was one of the, the probably the best to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so he's asking about how, how complicated it was for Sigourney to get into the, I guess, the body makeup of the clone that's on the slab. I think it was about a two and a half hour process. Um, we had the body, <clears throat> you know, minus the head. The, the arms were part of the body, and um, it was on a slant board. Uh, sorry, it was on a flat board, and she was on a slant board underneath. And so she would kind of, she would start and uh, go to get her makeup, and her makeup artist did her look, you know, with the teeth and all that stuff. And so she came ready to go, but we had just asked, don't put any makeup on the neck, because we had an appliance neck that would glue to her neck and then into the kind of a collarbone area of the Clone 7. And then, uh, so most of the most of the effort was, was us uh, blending that appliance. It had to be done in place. Um, and she was very patient. She's she's great because she's got a great sense of humor, so she keeps things light. And she she can joke around, and then she just needs a, a minute to sort of you know get into uh, the the moment, and uh, you know you sort of step away and let her do that. And then you know it's a challenge because my puppeteers are all underneath that with her, so so they're all under under there uh, you know bumping up against her, and and as they're operating. You know, breathing mechanisms and all that kind of stuff. But she's she's just terrific. You can you can put her through anything, and she's game. Yes. So 
So what attracts you all to a script and what makes you really decide yes? When I read the, the script for the first time, in fact, someone read it for me because I didn't speak English, you know, and I slept. It was very boring for me. <laughs> but I couldn't resist to Hollywood. It was such an opportunity to make a big Hollywood movie. So I thought, if you say no, every morning when you will shave yourself, you will think you refuse to Hollywood. So I said, in any case, I will be fired after three weeks, so let's go. <laughs> and they kept me. And, uh, Little by little, you know, to work with a, a amazing people. It was like my own film. And I modified, as I said, I modified some details. It, it became my story. And uh, it was a, a big adventure. And I met my wife. She was at the editing. So it was a big, big adventure. For the whole crew, it was an amazing, maybe the, the most, the stronger uh, year of my life. Yeah, for, for me, it was a chance to work with Jean-Pierre Genet because I was a huge fan, and also to be in an Aliens movie, you know, a big studio film, alien film, uh, sci-fi horror, so it was exciting to do it. But again, like Jean-Pierre Genet, you know, he's directing it, it's like, oh, are you kidding? I'll, I'll, I'll do anything in the movie. And for me, the nightmare was before me, with Les Scott, David Fincher, James Cameron. <laughs> 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 Yes. Um, you were among one of the last generations to have to make film with practical effects, and today we have CG that can make an entire film. If you were to do it over again, would you stick with practical effects, or would you use CG? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, practical effects if you were making the film now, or would you do it with CG? Yes, definitely. Because when you see the, la the two last uh, Alien from Ridley Scott, the technology is so high now, it's so perfect, and you cannot resist. But, uh, but even if in the last one, probably we have some close-up, uh, some work for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a mix of, te of technology. Yeah. But CGI now, it's so less expensive and so fast. It's a tool, it's just a tool, you know. You, you will need someone behind the computer to work. It's a human being, you know, will continue to, to work, it's not a machine. I, we talked last week, uh, Alec, about how this has affected creatures uh, in sort of the work that you guys do. I'm curious to hear a little bit about how it's affected miniatures. Ian, I think you could talk about that. <laughs> uh, it, it has quite a bit, except uh, you do have uh, an occasional director who does like to use practical effects and try to shoot things in camera still, uh, even having the uh, CG available to them. And uh, I, I got to work on First Man, which was Damien Chazelle's movie, and he insisted on no green screens and blue screens in the whole movie. So um, all of the shots within the cockpits or the capsules of the uh, space capsules are done against a giant LED screen. And we also built some uh, large miniatures for that and shot those. And so that, but, but here's the thing, though. Uh, there is CG in the movie, but it's the, the CG is up front instead of at the end. So all the backgrounds in space and much of the uh, views of uh, the Earth uh, seen from the uh, windows uh, were actually generated in CG beforehand and then used in front of the camera. And the one thing about, about doing it practically, uh, which we found was very um, advantageous, was the actors and the crew could react to it. Uh, the actors could see what was happening, they could act back and forth, and, um, and the operators, camera operators, would see something out the window, so they changed their um, operation. So having something in front of the crew uh, really does change the uh, performance of uh, the filmmaker and the actors. And I, I'm curious, actually, because I feel like we're going through a moment where there's maybe a bit of nostalgia expressed by fans for practical things in movies. And that's a you know, reflection of you know, the great films that were made by Amblin, Jim Henson, you know, um, things where the, the, I mean, just even the, you know, the, of course, the first Star Wars movies, uh, where the fans really lo fall in love with the aesthetic of there being something there. Uh, and I'm, yeah, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> you require two things to do practical effects in a film. You need a director, 
Jean Pierre, somebody who has decision making, storyboarding, and commitment. And you need to have that commitment follow all the way through to the end. So the challenge today, and Ian was very fortunate to work with Damien Chazelle because obviously, you know, those were all practical effects. But the challenge with practical work now is that one, directors are controlled a lot by the studios, and the studios also want to control the finished film all the way to the end. And if you're building miniatures and photographing them, you're kind of stuck with it. Like there's, there's shots of the movie, like also that, that observation room with the big thing, that was a six scale model, it was about 30 feet across, because it was, it was just too big to build full scale. And those were decisions that were made way in advance. And films now, because it's a little bit of a more, and again, not knocking today's filmmaking, but it's more corporate, so you have a lot more on the line. And it's very hard to do practical work, and, and certainly Alec, you can speak to this on the creature side, but you know, they're tweaking stuff in post a lot. And so if you're shooting a bunch of models and they're like, well, you know, we'd rather have it look entirely different, it's gonna get replaced. So I think that's, it, the fans do wanna see that. And we're always talking to people about, why don't they do more practical? I'm always asked that, why, why don't you do more practical work? It's like, it's not really up to us. And, and there are a lot of directors who wanna do it, but sometimes they just don't have the ability to make those choices. I just, I just did a movie with a practical uh, La Llorona and the monster herself, she was, a, it was an actress who played the character. So for, for us as actors, it, it was amazing to have her there to play the scenes off of. And, and for the tone and the atmosphere in the film, it was the only CGI was at the end of the movie, really. So it, it was great to have that, especially for an actor. And, and we have less pre-production time now too, to, to for the big, like makeup, makeup is doing very well these days because, and, and that's where you get a lot of the practical approach and fans love that. And it's critical for horror too, to not be knocked out of the reality by something that looks like a beautiful graphic. Um, but we don't, we just don't get as much uh, pre-production time. So there is, there is less ability to build, uh, you know, special fun things that you can test, you know. Yes. Uh, obviously, this film puts uh, a lot of energy in resurrecting the character of Ripley, and I have to assume the studio uh, anticipated following these characters, you know, with, with more sequels. So, was there any discussion on set about what might happen in, in the next film after in an Alien Five? So, was there discussion of what might happen after in an Alien Five? Yeah, about uh, the, the the ending on Earth, because. Uh, in a, in a previous version, they were, we, we were supposed to finish on Earth, but it was too expensive. Uh, imagine a kind of uh, trash for all spaceship, and it was very expensive, and so we forgot that. So. But uh, yeah, of course they were thinking, and there is another ending, very bad, it's on the Blu-ray or something, and <laughs> they are sit down on Earth, it's so cheap, <laughs> but you know, uh, it, would, it, well, it would have been an opportunity to make another film on Earth, of course, yes. Yes. So making a what? Hollywood after we were nine, nine, nine hundred and four people on Alien. In France, well, maybe forty. And but uh, on nine hundred and uh, four people, I knew probably fifteen people. <laughs> we were too much. It's too much. And I remember sometimes the, the special effects uh, in live. They were eighty sometimes. And I remember one time I was in the darkness to look for an idea, and suddenly I could hear. <laughs> It was a guy sleeping because he has nothing to do. <laughs> it was too much. You know. Let me ask a follow-up. What, what did you take from the experience of making Resurrection that you found useful when you went back to France? In France, uh, it was between friends, you know, and the, the, the union in USA is very tight, and you cannot, for example, you, you can pass. If it's 12, you have to finish. You have the grade, you can ask the grades for 12 other, the min, uh, 12 other minutes, you know. In France, it's cooler, it's cool. <laughs> everybody helps everybody, it's, uh, you are between friends. You know, it's a different game. Yes? So you went, you went to America to make a movie, you didn't speak English, but what is it like as a director, as an actor, to give direction in a language mm -hmm. 
I had an amazing interpreter, she was translated in simultane. It's like uh, a subtitles. <laughs> but after a while, you, you would actually say, can you shut up, we are speaking, you know? <laughs> and I discovered her for the promotion of the City of Lord Chilo, and she was amazing. Raymond, what is it like to have a filmmaker that doesn't speak your language? Well, you know, I, I think it was a very fluid setup because I didn't even remember that Jean Pierre didn't speak English. <laughs> I mean that that's how that's how easy it was, and his translator was was a really nice lady. But yeah, and, and he, he communicated everything very well. You know, we, we, we didn't have any problem at all. Even today, I don't speak English. I pretend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember him when we were playing pool. He said, "You cannot do that, Jive." <laughs> So how much of Joss Whedon's script is actually the film that we see? And when you made changes, did you work collaboratively with Joss? No, no, I work uh, making the, ring, uh, the process of the storyboard. And uh, except the ending, we changed the ending because it was a question of money. And um, I, I, I add some details. It was uh, some details and some small, might be more. For example, uh, Daniel Daya, to open the door, stupid joke, it's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take two last questions. One over here. How was it working with um, Mason on the on a wheelchair, and whose idea was it? But, uh, this is uh, another personal idea, to have the, the chair hiding the, the gun, you know. And uh, the, for the design of the prop, it was uh, a pleasure to design the, the chair, because you couldn't imagine you have a weapon on it at the beginning. And does the, the chair, the chair worked really well. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the sets were wide enough; we'd go through. But the chair, the chair worked really well. The Dominic was great. Is there a final thought out here? Okay, so we. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, wait. Okay, now you've got. I've got to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my question is that uh, for each one, is uh, what's your favorite, personal favorite deaths from the movie? <laughs> personal favorite deaths in this movie. Um, th they're all very uh, delightful. The only, story, <laughs> the only story I can tell you is that uh, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I told my mother, I said, oh, you guys see, this is the thing I just finished, it's great. Not really thinking about what it is. And she took her friend, and at the time, I guess she was in her 60s, and she's no longer with me, but, uh, and she called me, she's like, why are you telling me to see these movies? I'm like, well, that's why I work, it was really great. So, that's, so I see that, that's all I can think about it, is my mother sitting there going, mortified at like people getting their heads blown apart and everything else. So all the deaths are great. Yeah. I love the Brad Dourif's death because it, for me it was like an egg, uh, boiled egg, you know. <laughs> and I love him because they scratch the head. It was such a pleasure to kill everybody. <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell you, I, did, I didn't like my dad. I him getting slapped with KY jelly. Did I mention that? <laughs> we, you know, we had a great rig for your for the back of your head. We had a we had a fake head of you, and we had all these brains and stuff that we, we, we were thinking like, how do we get this? We want it to come right at the camera. How do we aim this? Like, is it air? Is it, we just put like monofilament little fishing line on all the brains and just yanked it right towards the camera. But it's so it's cut so quick, it's like a six frame uh, moment, but th that, that was a fun one. <laughs> Anyone else want to add to that? <laughs> uh, it, it's not a death, but one thing you guys don't know is uh, when Dan Hedaya is giving all that money to Michael Wincott, he says, he's a really hard to get hold of. The guy on the dollar bill or the money is Bill Bottolato, the producer, so that's why it was so hard to get that <laughs> <laughs> All right, we should we should uh, uh, we should wrap up. But I wanted to uh, say that we were talking Al, uh, we were talking about doing a group shot, right? Is there a way we could do that with uh, our special friend in the end of the stage? Let's take let's take a, a big group can, shot. Can we, before we get up and do that, can I just t tell you personally for me because I've I've been involved in three of these. Um, screenings. It's, this has been a blast, and you guys have really done a terrific job putting this whole thing together.
as a way of as a way of paying tribute to uh, to USC, I, I brought a letter uh, that I got from the USC Film School in 1979 that changed my life. It's, it goes like this: Dear Mr. Gillis, the selection committee has unfortunately declined. <laughs> but, and this is my, uh, and it goes it goes on to that. But I'm just really thrilled tonight to be here at the Lori Laughlin Theater. <laughs> No, seriously, I'm not trying to make a game. You, you did a great job, Alex. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight, sharing all of these stories, flying out here from Paris. Uh, this film is amazing, and I'm really glad that we got to share it with so many students here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.